Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're trying to build an online business or you want to set up a nice little space to show off your creative skills with the portfolio, or even if you wanted to just put together a creative gift, there are so many ways to take advantage of a web page. And Squarespace makes it as easy as possible. They have a huge variety of templates, fonts, color palettes, everything you need to show off your unique style without it being overwhelming. And it doesn't just stop at looks. You can take advantage of their behind the scenes analytics to see where your customers or viewers are coming from. They can pull all your social media accounts into one hub and help send out any messages or advertisements or whatever you have from one convenient spot and give you any notification from any of those websites there as well. Everything you need to build a proper marketing strategy to help you grow as a creator or as a business or really whatever you want. It's never been this easy to mark your place in the digital frontier. Go take a look for yourself. I've only mentioned a handful of features they offer. You can get a free trial going over at squarespace.com, and if you want to take the plunge, head over to squarespace.com slash gameapologist and get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you again to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and let's get back to it. The very first teaser we got for Sonic Frontiers ended with a mysterious symbol, and the very last thing we saw in the game itself, even after the credits rolled, was that same symbol. And in between all of that, never once do they explain what the hell it's supposed to be. That's been driving a lot of fans crazy, coming up with their own thoughts and theories, and I certainly have been doing that myself. To be completely upfront with you, I didn't want to release a video until I felt I had some kind of answer to that question, and thanks to a short conversation with a dear friend of mine, I think I finally have one. But before we get to any of that, like I said, there was a lot that's happened between that first teaser and those end credits, especially in terms of the story. So let's get into what I did and didn't like about the narrative and how they interpreted these characters and where I think they might be taking all of this moving forward. This might sound kind of weird coming from me specifically, but I don't usually need a deep narrative in a Sonic game to have a good time. I prefer a good story, especially since I deeply care for all of these characters, but considering the inconsistent mess of the core game lore, it's hard to get too worked up over this stuff. It's been a very long time since I've taken any of this too seriously, and I just roll my eyes anytime I see some idiot in the comments of my comic or character analysis videos that try to wave off the relevance of certain stories because something isn't considered canon to the main games, which is ridiculous because the games themselves can't decide what does and doesn't matter. So I stick with the comics if I'm looking to scratch a deeper narrative itch. I've made it no secret that I really enjoy the IDW series, and while a lot of the Archie Sonic stuff isn't perfect, I did fall back in love with that world long after I thought I left it behind, and while there are many talented people I want to personally thank for all of those amazing stories, there is a name that stands out amongst the bunch. Someone who helped get the mess of Archie in order, someone who rightfully was demanded to come back to lead the charge of the brand new comic canon, and someone who made me say before I said it about anybody else, wow, I wish they were writing for the games. That person is Ian Flynn, and that name is what made me pay attention to the story of Sonic Frontiers. Sure, I was a bit underwhelmed with the initial gameplay reveal, I still was looking forward to the game on some level, but separate from that footage was a press release. Sega had revealed that none other than Ian Flynn would be helping craft the story of the Starfall Islands. I don't know how extensive his reach is in terms of the story, games are a collaborative effort and that does include the narrative, but it was still a pretty huge deal seen the comic side of Sonic storytelling get a chance to shine in the main game series. I've grown up with the Archie comic, and it was pretty apparent, even as a kid, that Sega didn't really take that particular extension of the brand all that seriously. And considering all the stories through the years of miscommunication between Sega's internal teams, yeah, I didn't think anything like this was even possible in the past. So simply having Ian here and this involved already is a huge positive in my book. This decision, along with others as of late, has been showing me that Sega has been making the lore, world building, and characterization an important priority. Even if I don't agree with every single retcon or decision going forward, that's fine. You can't please everybody. It's just nice to see a more consistent vision and with people that grew up loving and understanding the hedgehog. I've covered a lot of Ian's work on Sonic Speed Reading, and I've made it no mystery that while I do still have my critiques here and there, I'm a big fan of his interpretation of these characters. He's helped craft some of the best stories in the franchise, and it's nice to see that finally recognized by 
by the people who make the games in a more official capacity outside of a polite forward in a comic collection, or a random tweet claiming that Naoto Oishima liked some of the American characters. Cool, I shouldn't have to dig for that kind of stuff. Whatever else I have to say about the story going forward, this to me is already a step in the right direction. That said, while I do heap a lot of praise up front here, there are a lot of issues I still have to pick apart, both with the story and with the characters. That's not to say that this is or is not on Ian. You don't build a game around a story, you build a story around the game. I'm sure there are exceptions to the rule, and a lot of the time you have to build both gameplay and narrative in conjunction with each other, but it still comes down to the directors and producers and probably plenty of other people in between them and Ian that decide what does and does not make it into the game. I'm just telling you all this right now because, yeah, while you can't see Flynn's influence everywhere in this game, he does not get the final say on the story. So don't get on his case if you don't like something. The man has to work with what he's got, even when there are things he doesn't personally agree with. Just for example, I have heard him say on the Bumblecast that it is his personal opinion the classic Sonic timeline makes the most sense when it plays out as Sonic 1, 2, 3, Knuckles, and then CD. Clears up a lot of goofy stuff with the Emeralds and Robot Sonic doubles, but Origins came around and said that definitively, Sonic CD takes place between Sonics 1 and 2, and Ian still had to craft the story in the little cutscenes in between the games showing just that. So yeah, creating games is not a simple cut and dry process. There are a lot of moving parts that we simply aren't privy to. Alright, so the basic plot is pretty straightforward. Eggman is exploring the Starfall Islands, attempting to take control of the advanced technology of the ancients who once lived there. But when he f***s around, he finds out. Attaching his new advanced AI to one of the shrines reactivates the long dormant tech and the portal to cyberspace, where Eggman ends up trapped. And I just have to say, I haven't heard the term cyberspace used this frequently since the mid-90s. And speaking of, I'm pretty sure this is just the plot of a Freakazoid episode. Oh man, I missed that show. Meanwhile, Sonic, Tails, and Amy are flying towards the Starfall Islands themselves, as they are the latest location of the Chaos Emeralds, which have been drawn there for some unknown reason. As the characters approach, a portal to cyberspace opens up, trapping the heroes inside. Sonic, as zippy as he is, moves fast enough to get himself out and back to the real world. Which, sure, why not? His speed can fix time, no reason it can't also use Wi-Fi. This leaves Sonic to track down and rescue the other Digidestin, all while learning more about the history of the islands, the ancients who left them behind, and even previously unknown information about the Chaos Emeralds themselves. But in his way is the new antagonist, Sage, who seemingly has control over these super robots known as Tights. And all the while, he's guided by a mysterious voice, which I'm sure in no way will be a problem later. But yeah, like I said, fairly straightforward, but it is a decent pitch. Leading up to the game's release, and even on the box and blurb, Sega was really pushing the mystery angle. A large part of the appeal was figuring out the history of the Starfall Islands. What exactly is cyberspace, these Cocos, the Evangelion mechs, and this weird little girl? And like I said up front, the first teaser for the game even ended with a mysterious symbol that looks like it belongs on the back of a Japanese car. But the simple fact that we still don't know what it actually means is pretty telling. Some feel it means that the game is leaving some things up for interpretation, or letting you figure it out for yourself, and others feel they didn't tell us quite enough to justify all this buildup. And uh, yeah, I kind of agree with both. Sure, a post credit implies that there's more story to tell, be it in some upcoming DLC, or maybe even the next game, and I gotta be honest, I'm down for an ongoing overarching narrative in the Sonic series. That sounds great, but I can't help but be a little trepidatious when they couldn't even keep classic Sonic consistent between two games. They changed this stuff on a whim. We're in the middle of a big shakeup right now, so yeah, I'm gonna remain cautious. But I do hope it's worth it, because I gotta tell ya, yeah, I was pretty underwhelmed with the reveals of this game. Turns out the ancients were actually a bunch of gooey people who look a lot like Chaos. In fact, the game flat out says they are directly related to Chaos. And they are the ones who brought the Chaos Emeralds to, I guess we'll call it Earth. Yeah, it seems the Emeralds came from outer space, or at least another planet, which doesn't have a name, which is probably named Mobius. The ancients escaped to Sonic's homeworld long ago, chased by a terrifying, overwhelming, mysterious force. They managed to escape it for a while, but eventually it tracked them down to their new planet. And not even their divine beast, sorry, Titans, stood a chance against this terrifying something, leaving the ancients no choice but to trap this evil power in cyberspace, a digital realm where they store their thoughts, feelings, memories, hell, even their souls. But also, it now must serve as a prison for this entity. Once Eggy arrived on the island and reactivated the tech, he in turn loosened the shackles on this beast. And plot twist, Sage is not the real enemy. She's 
Eggman's AI given form after merging with the ancient cyberspace, giving her slight influence over the Titans and other things here and there on the island, including trapping Sonic's friends. Rude. Her goal, as it turns out, runs parallel to Sonic's. The narrative portrays it initially as her seeking a safe means for Robotnik to escape cyberspace, but we learn later on she was aware of the history of the ancients and what they were keeping locked away. With her collected data, she knew it was only a matter of time before it escaped, but could not come up with a solution to save Eggman within the current parameters of her directive. We are slowly told all of this as Sonic runs around on the islands. Who has been through enough adventures to know that, yeah, there's probably more going on than what meets the eye. He knows this mystery voice might be trouble, but it at the very least gives him some kind of guideline on how to save his friends, which remains his primary goal, regardless of whatever else he learns or how much corrupting energy he takes on with every digital cage he busts his buddies out. This clearly has a detrimental effect on him, but it does grant him new abilities to aid him on his adventure. But even if he cracks open cages, his friends still remain in a ghostly, transparent digital state, meaning he still has work to do even after releasing them from their prisons. This all comes to a head on Rhea Island. Here, the mystery voice tells Sonic to shut down the towers and break down the barriers between cyberspace and his reality, the last step to return Tails, Amy, and Knuckles to their original forms. And while this does return them to normal, unfortunately, Sonic takes on too much of the corrupted energy and it leaves him in a frozen state caught between realities. While at the same time, the mystery voice reveals itself to be the locked away enemy. Oh, shock, can you even believe it? And it possesses the final fourth Titan and heads off towards Uranus Island. So the big bad is let loose, our hero is out of commission, and yeah, it does sound like the final moments of Sonic 06, doesn't it? Even down to the obnoxious fake out death. But don't you worry, because they reverse all of that stupid buildup within the exact same cutscene as the three friends hold hands around Sonic and undo all the work he's done up to that point. What a bunch of jerks. From there, Sonic teams up with the now-released Eggman and Sage to, well, let's be honest, go fishing for the rest of the collectibles so you can get the Chaos Emeralds, and then take on the final Titan and head up to space to fight the moon. I know it's called the end, but I really wish it was called Mobius. I mean, it would hurt me deep, but at least I would feel something. Sonic and Sage take this thing out. Sage apparently dies. The friends are freed, and they all leave the islands happily ever after. But Sage is still lost to Eggman, who has grown to see her as a daughter. But as the after credits reveal, Eggy is working on something. And as a mysterious symbol pops back on the screen, we once again hear Sage's voice alluding to this not actually being the end of her story. But yeah, in a nutshell, that's what happens in Sonic Frontiers. Like I said, it's fairly straightforward. But when you sit down with it, there is some really cool stuff here. A little more than I initially imagined, but at the same time, it still falls short in other ways that hopefully get expanded down the road. But if there's one thing this game was not short on, it's references to past games. Seriously, it name drops so many things it would make Family Guy blush. Overall, I don't mind them. I actually like how much effort this game makes re-establishing so much canon that's been up in the air for so long. Something that Sonic Origins also went out of its way to do, and also still fell short in some ways. I'll talk about that another day. But I am very thankful they are making the effort to clear things up and tell fans old and new, this stuff matters. It's insane to me that even the classic games were up in the air in terms of the modern canon, to the point that, as on the nose as it was, giving us a literal screenshot of Sonic 3 went a long way to tell us that the entire history of the Hedgehog is being considered and taken into account. And we even get name drops for characters that exist in different canons, confirming they exist somewhere in the universe of the main canon. They mention sticks and Tangle, so something from Sonic Boom survived and finally something from the comics gets to exist in one of these games. I was really hoping those acorns you get while fishing were a reference to Sally Acorn, but I knew that was already a stretch, and even Ian Flynn himself thinks that wasn't the case at all. But it just goes to show how desperate that fan base is when they see an acorn and say, well, I'll take it, it's better than nothing. But yeah, I don't mind references, and in some cases, I wish there were more of them. But the problem is the frequency and how some of this information is presented. They name drop Sticks and Cream as an ending teaser. They mentioned Tangle while Sonic runs past some ruins. Apparently, I never managed to trigger that voice clip. They show an altar that resembles the Master Emerald Shrine on Angel Island, which would be an awesome visual reference to pick apart, but then Sonic flat out says, oh well, that looks like a Master Emerald Shrine. And I'm sorry, I don't actually have any footage of that either, because it just randomly popped out of Sonic's mouth while I was running somewhere. I wasn't anywhere next to one of those shrines. It's a problem of show versus tell. Yeah, I'm happy to have Ian on board, and knowing one of his creations is recognized by the core game series is 
real cool. But show us, Tangle. Show us, Sticks. That's where you get fans cheering. Those are the moments that stick with you. Yes, it's nice to know that Sega is finally acknowledging characters they already own. And no, it's not reasonable to shoehorn in characters when the game clearly already was struggling with the resources they had available. Clearly, they did the best they could with what they had. And yeah, best they could probably do was the occasional name drop or reference to past events. It certainly won't take away from any Tangle fan's excitement to see her voice and rendered in a future game. And she's already in a mobile game. But still, these references feel a little sloppy, and I think they could have baked them in a little better, especially with the ruined design comparisons to Angel Island. I have so many problems with cyberspace levels, but I thought at the very least they would try to justify why we only have four different locations. We see the three islands where the classic games took place, and we get a city zone, which could represent where Perfect Chaos attack, all important places where the Chaos Emeralds resided. Maybe they were drawn to those locations thanks to hidden ancient technology we were previously unaware of. I don't know, I guess I just wanted more story for the Chaos Emeralds. I don't mind if they're from outer space. I mean, I don't love it either. I've always considered Sonic's world unique. That's why I've never liked the idea of calling it Earth. The idea of Mobius being this special world with powerful gems, loop-de-loops, and power rings was kind of cool on its own. But even if it is just an alternate reality Earth, maybe the introduction of the Chaos Emeralds helped evolve the life and the landscape eons ago. But they never really talk about that at all in the game. But even with that considered, in the old days, you always had to collect the Chaos Emeralds from special stages, which made them feel otherworldly even in a place as wild as Sonic's world. And that only felt backed up when the games introduced the Soul Emeralds being from a parallel universe. So yeah, I really don't care where they come from, but I would like more story about how they affect the world around them. That and Chaos always felt like a confusing element for me when he was first introduced. Between him and the Chow and this connection with the Master Emerald and in turn the Chaos Emeralds, back then it felt like a lot of new elements than I was used to from the classic games. That got less weird as more Eldritch Horrors were introduced in later games, but Chaos and the Chow always had an alien vibe to me. I like the idea of this being the Sonic version of the Grey Men. And while at first I wasn't quite into how they explained how the Ancients eventually became the Chow and then from there one of them mutated into Chaos, which yeah, that isn't fully explained, but that's exactly what happened. I do admit I like the idea of an alien life force evolving once it acclimated to a new planet, and apparently with the help of the radiation from the Master Emerald. That's a really cool idea. And this might be the only time I ever say this, it also helps justify the existence of the Black Arms a little bit more. So tying the Chaos Emeralds to a race of creatures that looked like Chaos made all this new information okay for me. That is until they showed us that the Master Emerald apparently originated on Sonic's home planet. So the Chaos Emeralds did not originate from this world, but the Master Emerald does. And some of the ancients went off to check it out, and then they turned into Chow. Which, cool, I don't know if anybody was asking too many questions about any of this stuff, but I suppose at the very least it does get the imagination flowing. These are fun ideas they could explore down the line. But at the same time, this feels kind of half-hearted. Like, yeah, this is a fairly big reveal, but it's vague enough that they could roll it back if the fanbase doesn't take well to this new information. The emeralds seem to exist beyond time and space, found in special stages brimming with, well, chaos, and only a creature like Sonic or someone who could keep up with Sonic could navigate those wild environments and challenges and earn that power. There's potential for interesting lore there. Yeah, they did just start off as an extra reward for the player, but even back in the day, they started building narratives around those gems. So I'm down to delve further into that, but if you're gonna shake things up, then you have to commit. They showed us a society built around the emeralds, and it turns out the emeralds were native to the same planet as those ancients, this alien species that existed long before the echidnas or Gaia shrines or any of that. The Chaos Emeralds are essentially confirmed to have formed separate from the Master Emerald, and yet they're drawn to a planet where this great gem resides. Cool. Does that mean the Ancients crafted the Emeralds? Did the Master Emerald once come from their planet? Or maybe this is alluding to other Master Emeralds on other planets? And what does this say about other magical gems on Sonic's home world? They just introduced us to the Phantom Ruby. Does that have a deeper story, or are we just going to continue to pretend that it doesn't exist? Or maybe we need to wait another five years before the next game randomly references that. I don't know. And what about the rings? Do they have an interesting backstory? What's their connection to the emeralds? Are they separate from them? Are they born from them? Do they act as power sources? Or are they portals to emeralds in special stages? Or are they still just considered mechanics without story importance? And while we're at it, why are there so many random monitors that power you up? I actually did have somebody on Twitter say that what if they were just tiny little portals to 
cyberspace like they contained a little bit of cyberspace energy within them. That is kind of cool. I'd be down for that. And hey, if you retcon the special stages to be cyberspace portals in general, that would also be sick. There's a lot of potential there, but again, I'm worried that's all it would ever be. If we're going to start down this path, then go all in. At least tell me where the rings come from. Well, oh my god, wait, there are real bees in this game. What if they're making the rings? What if Channel Pup was right? If they canonize bee theory, I will never play another Sonic game in my life. Maybe this is part of the long con. I've read too much of Ian's stuff. I've seen the commitment from Sega to get a cohesive lore set up. Azuka said this is going to set up the basis for the next set of Sonic games. And as on the nose as some of these references are, clearly they're letting us know what does and does not matter in terms of game canon. Maybe they want us speculating, keeping the franchise active through debates and discussions on Twitter, YouTube videos, podcasts. Speaking of, be sure you check out Sunset City. Can't promise it's always the most insightful of Sonic discussions, but at the very least, that B thing will make a lot more sense. Maybe this is all here to help set up some of that upcoming DLC or the next game. Give me an open world Angel Island. Or hell, that long rumored adventure remake could further expand on the lore of Chaos and the Chow with this new knowledge in hand. The game clearly intends to carry on story elements from this game into future entries, so I really hope they show some courage and keep going with the story of the emeralds because what they gave us here didn't do too much to add to what we already know in fact it contradicts stuff we have had set up in previous games and i could say that maybe folks that aren't hyper obsessed with sonic might not care all that much but it is a major part of this game's story i mean for crying out loud they pretend to have different difficulties with an easy mode that lets you focus on the story like this is a naughty dog game but at the same time they also throw in a hard mode that locks off the final part of the story and never tells you about it. <sighs> Focus up, Nick. This is the story discussion. If you're not going to flesh out any more Emerald stuff in this game, then the new elements you bring in better be engaging enough to make this a satisfying experience. Unfortunately, what we get is a very simple, very predictable narrative stretched paper thin across 20 hours with a boring antagonist who, uh, shocking no one, isn't the real bad guy. The real bad guy is far less interesting than a girl who spends most of the game emotionless and refusing to tell anybody what's going on. This is why this stupid little symbol is so annoying. This game is so obsessed with the mystery of it all, but not interested in giving us satisfying answers. I enjoy a good mystery, but not when the answers are more mysteries. I don't mind what's here, but there's just not enough of it. I appreciate Sonic getting annoyed with cryptic nonsense when he talks with Sage, but acknowledging it doesn't make it any better. Just like Breath of the Wild, they reveal the most interesting information near the beginning of the game while doling out far too little information through the rest of the adventure, and it leads to a very unsatisfying conclusion. I don't mind leaving things up to interpretation. I don't mind a game not spelling every little thing out and trusting the player to figure stuff out themselves, but at the same same time, I find it weird what information they decided to prioritize, because while they keep some things vague, other times they spell it out in embarrassing detail, and other times they focus on stuff nobody was ever going to ask about in very strange ways. They literally explain the signs and map as being actual elements that exist in the game. Sonic sees all this stuff thanks to merging with cyberspace. There was even a scene with Sonic and Knuckles talking about a strange symbol, and during my first playthrough I thought they were talking about just just a bunch of random rubble, which didn't make any sense, until I realized that the question mark was still present in the cutscene. That's not just a marker for the player. They can see that. It's present in the reality of this story. Like imagine in the classic games, if Sonic and Tails just stopped, looked up, and pointed out the score and ring counter and asked what that was all about. What happens when it reaches 10 minutes? Actually, I'm surprised they didn't do that in this game. You guys thought the last decade was meta? It doesn't get much more meta than this. Also, it decanonizes Mario and Sonic at the Olympic Games because Sonic has no idea what a question mark is. That said, we do have more to dive into, not just with the story, but with the characters themselves. Sonic's cast, like it or not, will probably always remain as they are. They're never going to age. Not really. Maybe they remove numbers so people stop getting so weird about which imaginary rats can kiss each other. They are kids, they are teens, or they are young adults, or they're somewhere in between all of that. They can be any or all of it, and it doesn't matter. They are cartoons. They are mascots. Even when they get creative or branch off on rare occasion, they will always 
default back to some recognizable state to stay safe or kids. But they still manage to nudge these characters forward in their story ever so slight. Sonic on his surface would seem to remain the same, confident and quick-witted, but the way he talks to each individual friend or enemy shows a far more level-headed and patient hedgehog than we've ever seen before. And a part of me hates that. To me, Sonic needs a little more edge, a little more attitude. Being a pariah who is the voice of reason, making all the plans, always saving the day without fail, it's just kind of boring. His design and skill set almost demands a bit of attitude. A carefree, fun-loving, sassy boy who can get under the skin of his enemies, but is still so frustratingly charming you can't help but love him. That's what makes the rest of his cast so great. Amy was a girl with the energy and drive to chase down someone like Sonic the Hedgehog. Tails was a plucky young sidekick who adores his friend, but can still keep him on task thanks to his big brain. And Knuckles, a hot-headed, punch-first, ask-questions-later kind of dude who Sonic loves to clash with. Yeah, that's a winning formula. One that they still portray to some degree anytime we get a classic story in the comics. I still miss that kind of Sonic. I feel this one's edges have been sanded down a little bit too much. But that's not enough for me to dislike this character. Not by any means. The way I see it, Sonic has been through 30 years of adventures, even if he hasn't aged 30 years in his fiction. Regardless, he has aged all the same, gaining new experiences with every new encounter, learning lessons, and growing as a person from his interactions with the people closest to him. Because that's how life works. Things don't stay static. And if there's anybody who shouldn't stand still, well, that's Sonic the Hedgehog. And while there aren't any drastic changes immediately noticeable to the casual observer, Sonic has grown. And whether or not you like some of his interpretations or stories in previous games, Frontiers has made it pretty clear it all happened and it all will be accounted for. Sonic has been the sole reason this planet survived many times over. The point where, yeah, it would almost make sense that everyone around him has grown dependent on him on some level. I think that might be most apparent with Tails. Just the idea of being a sidekick implies you are second fiddle to someone more important. Sonic is the hero of this world, and yet it makes sense Tails would idolize him, but even though he clearly has his own skills that make him stand out from Sonic, even though he's been side by side with the best role model he could ever hope for, he is still stuck firmly in the shadow of Sonic. No matter how tight those two are, no matter how good Sonic is to Tails, insecurities will still grow. And since we have to deal with Sonic forces being canon, we also need to make sense of Tails being a coward in front of an enemy he should have no problem with. The only thing that helps forces make any kind of sense is that even when Tails has shown that he can be a hero all by his little old self, in the back of his mind he always knew that if things ever got truly bad, Sonic's around somewhere and he'll fix things. He always does. And when Tails thought Sonic died, he lost that safety net. He lost the closest thing he had to family. And I don't care what you say, grief can do a nasty number on you. I mean, it doesn't explain why he just watched Sonic get killed in the first place, but I'm not made of miracles here. Point is, fans were unhappy, but they still addressed it, and while it wasn't the most eloquent thing on the planet, I'm proud of them for not shunning the less than savory elements from previous games. Tails is the most logical and reasonable character of the bunch, and I appreciate how often he was discussed leading up to his reveal. Sonic, Amy, and Knuckles do a solid job figuring things out about the island, but even early on, Amy's like, yeah, we should probably find Tails. He's the smart one. He'll figure it out. I love that his intelligence is used in a reasonable way. He's at his best when he's put to work analyzing alien technology, giving that big brain of his a new puzzle to solve. But as intelligent as he is, doubt can still creep in, with his Coco story making him reflect on all the times he failed to act, worrying that he is a burden to Sonic, even mentioning that he saw a dark copy of himself pointing out all of his failures, which would have been really nice to see in game, but you know, whatever. But this does take the chance to show us why Sonic and Tails are such a good team, because Sonic reminds Tails just how much of a hero he already is, eventually leading to the conclusion that once everything's over, the fox intends to strike out on his own and become his own man. I think they did a great job bringing in all of these messy bits of characterization over the years and making sense out of all of it, because nobody is just one thing, hateful or helpful, selfish or selfless. We respond to different stressful situations in different ways depending on a countless number of outside factors, especially when you're a kid. Yeah, I said ages don't matter, but it's still implied that Tails is a bit younger than the rest of the crew. He is still a kid. And no matter how smart he is, Tails still has a lot of emotional growing to do. But even now, Sonic sees, as he always has, Tails has a big heart to match that big head full of 
clever ideas and all the potential in the world. And he gives Tails nothing but support. It shows how healthy they are, not just as friends, but as a family. And it shows us that while Tails does still see Sonic as his hero, he has grown to see him as something far more important, his brother. But the stories don't stop with the fox. We see just how strong the Brotherhood is also with Knuckles. And uh, wow, Amy wishes Sonic would look at her like that. There was a substantial amount of love given to the Echidna leading up to this game. He gets a full animated prologue, and it's one of the best pieces of any Sonic media. Putting the focus back on his mission of protecting the Master Emerald and Angel Island, and considering their connection to Chaos, the Chow, as well as the ruins of Angel Island and Sky Sanctuary, Knuckles is easily the most invested in the history of the ancients, and I was desperate to get to his cutscenes because of that very reason. But unfortunately, this also fell a little short for me. I keep saying it over and over again, but if they were gonna do an open world Sonic game, it really should have been a Knuckles game. And I hope beyond hope that we get an open world Angel Island with him someday. I mean, he'd already work well with the new combat mechanics, and oh god, please just don't screw up that DLC Sega. Point is, there's a greater emphasis not only on Knuckles, but everything his presence brought into the larger lore of the Sonic universe. And as much as I love Sonic 3 Knuckles and Sonic Adventure, yeah, obviously this was going to make me hungry for more. But as for the Echidna himself, they not only get him back on track with the island and Master Emerald, but they also directly discuss how lonely his life must be as a guardian, how hard it is for him to make connections with others. And they also use him to discuss the military aspect of the ancients because he was a general in forces, so hey, again, they aren't ignoring the weird decisions of the previous game. Jokes aside, I do love the more playful nature between Sonic and Knuckles. Throughout the game, Sonic's sass has been heavily downplayed, which, yeah, I guess it makes sense for the tone they're setting, but where he shows concern for Tails and Amy, when it comes to Knuckles, he just smirks when he comes across his cage, and they just sass each other the moment the red boy is free. They started off wanting to kill each other, and over the years, they've grown into friendly rivals. I know a lot of people felt that was thrown away with the arrival of Shadow, because it was, but I do appreciate Frontiers not only for showing Knuckles going back to basics, in some aspects, but allowing him to grow in other ways. At this point, Knuckles is a brother to Sonic. Not a younger brother like Tails, but more his own age, if not slightly older. And they also give him a bit of dimension, letting him let down his guard, talking about how jealous he is of Sonic's freedom. He can openly talk about that with Sonic, his closest friend. How great is it that he can be this vulnerable with someone he tried to kill when they first met? I love the glares and the mean mugging, something they clearly did all the time in the early days, and now they just laugh it off. And when Sonic pushes him to get out there and see the world, Knuckles is open to the idea, which is a huge step for him. But he says that he first must get back to his island, and I can't help but wonder if there isn't a metatextual message in there, because yeah, let's get our boy and those games back to Angel Island for a bit. That would be rad. But yeah, the journey of Tails and Knuckles are pretty straightforward. The one I was having a little more trouble tackling was of the first ally we encounter, Amy Rose. See, even if the other two have been mishandled here or there over the years, everyone still knows their basic deal. But Amy, where she was once defined, has been through more changes than just about anybody else on Sonic's cast. And I've been a fan of her different portrayals, and I think the comics and shows have been trying to do their best to give her something more than obsess over Sonic. Actually, I have a full video planned just for Amy, because this deserves a lot of analysis, and we will be here all day if we get into it. But the long and short of it is that I don't think Sega has known what to do with this character for a long time. I think that's why I I found her story a little too vague at first, talking about love and sharing love with the rest of the world. And at first I thought this was her moving on from Sonic. Like she's finally accepting that he won't reciprocate the love she feels for him and she's going to move on and do something more with her life. But that didn't feel quite right to me. And I wasn't sure how to properly convey her story or my interpretation of it until I had a chat with my good friend Stevie Cole, who is possibly the biggest Amy fan I know. As she put it, Amy had witnessed through the help of Cyber Cyberspace and Coco, Memories of the Ancients. And there, she saw two souls finding each other again after thousands of years after they tragically perished. As Amy puts it herself, she witnessed a love that transcended beyond time and space, and she believes in that. Love means everything to her. She understands its power and the good it can bring others, and she has the ability to do that for the world. But she's never really branched out all that far because of her love of Sonic. She wants to be a part of his life, a part 
part of his adventure. And obviously she can't be two places at once. Amy wants to go down a separate path, but she would never ask Sonic to stop running down his. She's not worried about loving Sonic any less if she goes off and sees the world, but I think she has always been scared that Sonic would move on from her. And really, who can blame her? He's never fully committed to a proper relationship in these games. But while that fear is understandable, we now have a Sonic who instead of running away from her like he did in the old days, reassures her when he says he can't wait to hear all about her adventures when she gets back, letting her know he's always going to be there for her, and fully supports her journey of self-discovery. And I loved hearing them actually debate and push back against each other. Amy doesn't just go along with whatever Sonic says because it's Sonic, she will challenge him if she doesn't agree with him. Between that, the journey she went on with the Coco, and the one she's about to take on by herself, I think this shows that her love for Sonic is not a superficial one. She is well beyond the point of idolization. She loves him for who he is, warts and all. And I'm excited to see what else she becomes that is more defined than just what she feels for Sonic. Because she deserves it. She's an amazing character. And I also miss the hammer mechanics. I don't care what anyone says about Sonic Adventure. I absolutely love that stuff. Fortnite's doing it. Everyone loves the hammers in Fortnite. They're just being Amy Rose. Just bring back Amy's hammer. This feels like a steady growth for all of these characters. But if you take a step back, these are essentially the same story beats they went through with Sonic Adventure. It's not entirely one for one, but you can still draw parallels easily enough. Tails became his own hero. Amy stopped being the damsel in distress, stopped waiting around for Sonic to save her, and Knuckles got to dig in more to his own history. And yeah, I don't know. They didn't really go too far with Knuckles, did they? The point is, they did have stories of these characters becoming their own people before, and cynically, I could say, well, they just brought them back to the exact same point they were over 20 years ago. But the series and these Rainbow Rats have been all over the place. They needed to be reorganized. And it was cool to see how Sonic has grown through the relationships he shares with his friends. Every story is somewhat predictable. The status quo doesn't shift all that much. But all the same, I know some of these character interactions and conversations meant the world to fans. And I'm not above that. I love it too. I like where they're taking these guys and I hope to see more. They are amazing characters and they deserve all the love in the world. They aren't a detriment to Sonic gameplay. And this game is telling us that Sega is finally learning the right lessons. Bring these guys back, just make them fun to play. And there is another character who has shown a massive amount of growth, but at the same time is barely in the game. And I'm speaking of course of the villainous Dr. Eggman, whose presence is largely underplayed this time around, but we still manage to see a new side of Ivo all the same. And that's thanks to Sage. The mad scientist, as the story carries on, grows to see this AI as his daughter. I guess under that shell is a soft-boiled Eggman. This runs parallel with the story of Belle and Mr. Tinker in the ongoing comic series, and Ian has said that his work on Sage and Evan's work on Belle are purely coincidental. But either way, it's pretty clear these guys have been striving to get a bit more dimension onto the character of Dr. Eggman. And I'm all for it. We've only ever been given the briefest glimpses of humanity when Robotnik was confronted with the sins of his grandfather all the way back in Sonic Adventure 2. And I always wanted to see his familial ties further explored. And I think putting Eggman in the role of a father is a great way to do just that. It's just too bad that the game hides most of it from you. This, I feel, was a major element of the narrative that deserved to be front and center, not left at the bottom of a lake. Don't get me wrong, while I'm not happy with the distribution of this particular side story, I did still enjoy the egg memos quite a bit, and in some cases, I felt this was the perfect way to gain more insight into the mind of Eggman. It's fun hearing him piece together what exactly cyberspace is supposed to be, asking the questions that spark the curiosity of the players, getting them on the right track for the mystery themselves. And we also get further insight to his personal psyche, how he became the way he is, with a hint of jealousy towards how well his family treated Maria when he was right there, and laying out his thoughts on all of Sonic's allies, with special attention given to the intelligence of Tails, seeing the potential, but still somewhat thankful that the fox is blind to it himself, as Tails could become a far greater threat if he knew what he was capable of. I love the egg memos, and I wouldn't change much about them. They are well written and well voiced, but I wanted to see him actually talk to most of these other characters. I was pretty disappointed at Eggy's lack of interaction with everyone. Flynn has made it no secret that Eggman is one of his favorite characters to write, and that shows on every story he's ever penned featuring Robotnik. I was excited to see how Sonic would interact with the rest of the cast, don't get me wrong, but no more excited to see him finally be reintroduced to his oldest enemy. Some of my favorite moments from Flynn's stories are just the insults slung between 
between these two. And we get a grand total of two interactions between them that only last a couple of seconds. And as I keep saying, I would have loved to have seen more of the relationship formed between Eggman and Sage on screen, in the cutscenes. We get a little, but I don't know if it's enough to justify this corny ass montage with Sage reflecting on like three other cutscenes of mostly flat dialogue, reporting in on Sonic's progress, and then smacking some helicopters around, which I had just witnessed a couple minutes prior to this scene. It just feels so forced. I laughed like an idiot when this sappy ass music started playing. I don't think I really feel anything for Sage at all one way or the other. She just shows up and basically tells me how I'm supposed to feel about Sonic, telling me all about his personality instead of just showing me his personality. She says he's brash and impatient, but like, nah man, that's not this Sonic. He's boring as hell. And even when the game does a good job showing me the bonds between Sonic and his friends, I then have to listen to Sage just lay it all out for me immediately after watching the scene. Spoon feed it to me, video game. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand why all of this is happening. Sage is a brand new life form, an AI that is suddenly given sentience. The way she describes Sonic at first is how Eggman describes Sonic. She only knows the hedgehog through what she's been told by her father. And through the adventure, she learns to grow the more she watches the blue beast take down titans and saving his friends. This isn't just a silly adventure to him. His friends are in danger and he will do everything he can to say- Oh god, I'm doing what Sage is doing. Is Sage just a Sonic tuber? Oh god, am I just a Sonic? Oh no. Point is yes, it's easily justified and if you love her character, I don't blame you in the slightest. I do still blame you for that other thing. You know what you did. I don't hate her at all. I just don't feel much for her one way or the other and I felt they laid it on a little thick with a sap when it wasn't properly earned. And I guess it's just a little frustrating because I know how talented one of the writers is for this story and I know given the chance we could have seen something really special fleshed out here. They did hit me right in the heart with that final conversation between Sage and Eggy as he sends her off to her death. Those subtle little bits of acting are so good and they go so much farther than a corny montage or an end credit song that basically says I'm sorry I'm dead daddy. But as we saw in the final tease this probably won't be the last time we see Sage and while I might have my problems with a narration here or there I'm excited to see where they take things with this new character. Now that we don't need to deal with the mystery of who she is and her role in the story maybe now we can just focus on building up who she is as a character and the relationship with her father and maybe we can also focus on her father a little bit more this next time around. I'm really excited to see what they do if they continue that tease and we see what Aegi does with the full power of cyberspace at his disposal. I know I already complained about the lack of Eggman but that's largely because I was excited to see him play off against the other legacy characters with this new direction in writing. In terms of his use as an antagonist I don't mind them shifting their focus on a new enemy but you need to make sure that whatever you're replacing him with is interesting in its own right and the end is anything but that. Not only did they replace the primary antagonist just as they brought on board a writer who has more professional experience with Eggman than just about anybody, but they also kept the mystery of the villain a secret throughout the entire game only to reveal uh, clouds or something and then it turns into the moon. There's nothing wrong with force of nature antagonists, but you need to pair them with a secondary villain with a big personality to help balance the scales. It's a super common trope, but it works and it was used a great effect in, I can't believe I'm saying this, Sonic 06. Solaris is the big looming threat, but for most of the narrative, at least during Shadow's run, the focus is on Mephilus, and really he is the standout from that story. Sega does their best to bury 06, but anytime there's any compliment thrown towards the game, Mephilus is usually in the conversation, and I certainly didn't see a Solaris on a tech deck. Zelda has done this a couple of times to great effect with the likes of Xant or Girahim, but the game that Frontiers takes its foundation from, Breath of the Wild, kept most of the focus on Calamity Ganon, whose presence is everywhere through the adventure. Frontiers tried to do something similar with the end, but it never really does anything. You're mostly fighting the technology of the ancients. The most the end does is wreck a few islands in flashbacks, but outside of that 
final fight, it never actually presents a threat to Sonic. We're just told that it's a big, stinking deal. And we're mostly told that by the end itself. It just rambles on in the final confrontation only to be shot down by a mech we just stole back from it. Compare that to Calamity Ganon, who is also being locked away, but just barely. Not only does Hyrule's battle scars do a great job of alluding to the power of this thing, Link himself was defeated by the Calamity before he ever got to Ganon proper. And yeah, both games feature ancient technology going after the heroes, but they at least tie Ganon into that as well, as he's the one in control of all the technology going after Link. And the leaking malice has a huge effect on the world that is just now finding its footing a century after that first attack. We don't see the final form of Ganon until the end of the game, but the malice and the sub-boss encounters allude to the horrible twisted mess that you eventually have to face down. Even then, the dark, horrible form is always looming in the distance surrounding Hyrule Castle. It is always a looming presence, also like Zelda did years ago with a moon. Calamity Ganon does a much better job conveying an overwhelming threat in comparison to the end. And keep in mind, I still don't think Breath of the Wild did a great job with that. There's a reason they're going back to that villain for a second go-around when Tears of the Kingdom drops. The end represents, well, ending. Death. A vast, empty nothing that will inevitably consume all. These are big, powerful themes to play around with, and despite my misgivings, I'm honestly proud of Sonic Team for at least attempting to dip their toes into storytelling that could lead to a good old-fashioned existential crisis. But there's just not enough payoff to this build-up, which is so frustrating because I was hoping this threat would at the very least tie in more with the Chaos Emeralds in some way. Or maybe this was a form of chaos. Kind of like how they played around with the ideas of positive and negative energy at the end of Sonic Adventure. And even back then, I thought that just came out of nowhere and then left just as quickly. They never touched that particular subject again. I thought this would have been a great place to further expand on those ideas. What if the Ancients did indeed create the Emeralds, or at the very least mined them from their planet and harnessed it for themselves, and somehow there was a dark force created in response to their arrogance, thinking they had the ability to control chaos. Or maybe the home planet of the Ancients became corrupted once the chaos energy was trapped within the gems and it became sentient and crazy. I don't know. You can do a lot of cool stuff with a celestial body. Like, what if the Ancients escaped their home world and then it turns out they're running away from the world itself? Just get wild and crazy with it. Why not? Or hey, maybe it's not a moon. Maybe we could have done something along the lines of perfect chaos. After all, chaos is just a mutated Chow, and the Chows, as we found out from this game, evolved from the Ancients, and if they all came from the same source, the End, the Ancients, the Chaos Emeralds, I think it would make more sense if it took on the form of something more akin to Perfect Chaos. Like, what if all that negative energy in Perfect Chaos was only alluding to the full, powerful form of the End? That would have been a great way to tie that all together, and you really don't need to play Sonic Adventure to fully appreciate a big, crazy, cool-looking monster. I know I'm branching out a bit from what the game actually gives us. I'm sure they had a lot of crazy ideas they just couldn't get to, but I needed a little bit more than this. There was a heavy melancholy theme throughout the entire game, with the stories we explored not only with the legacy characters, but with Sage and everything we witnessed with the Ancients. But even with all of that considered, I don't think the end really explored the themes on display as well as it could have, and it doesn't justify the build-up mystery and certainly isn't a satisfying threat to conquer. Just, I don't know, I've been trying to think of ways to properly enjoy this character, this force, but I'm just coming up short here. I really think they dropped the ball, sorry, moon on this one. And I know it sounds like I don't enjoy a lot of these new elements brought into this game, but I do need to stress that's not the case. I don't even hate having a moon enemy. Kirby's adventure in Final Fantasy IX taught me that orbs make for kick-ass encounters. But yeah, I couldn't even get a satisfying final boss fight out of this thing. And while I don't hate any of these new elements, there's just not enough of it or it's all horribly predictable. Nothing here really surprised me. Well, okay, almost everything. The Coco are an interesting new element, and they took them in a direction I wasn't quite expecting. They teased these designs, and we all thought they were gonna be like a rock form of the Chow, or a pre-evolved Chow, and when I started the game, I was under the assumption that they were going to reveal the Coco as the ancients themselves. They just always look like these dinky little critters. And as it turns out, all of these theories are technically true to some degree. Yeah, another Zelda comparison with the Koroks is obvious, but I didn't expect the Coco to be much more than collectibles. Another cute little thing they can sell us as a plush. And even making my way through the first little story, seeing how Amy could relate to these silly little things as they try to reconnect with its loved one. When these two little Coco finally reunited, the last thing I expected 
wanted to see was a flashback akin to Sonic Adventure, showing me chaos-like creatures reaching out to each other in their final moments of life. I say chaos-like because it was clear that something was different when compared to the God of Destruction, where their hearts should be sat these little glowing forms, unmistakably what the Coco represent. The flashback ended, and when we were pulled back to the present, that mysterious symbol lights up the sky and these silly little critters who we helped on their silly little quest laid motionless eyes closed with a soft smile on their faces. You could say in some way they are the ancients, and by that reasoning they are also kinda sorta of the chow. But what they really are, more than anything else, are ghosts. Every time Sonic stopped and the little dancing Coco appeared, I kept thinking how these little things represented a people that did not get a peaceful ending, their memories lingering for eons in these tiny vessels without resolution. Every smiling face is a restless soul. The game describes them as lucky charms of the ancients that inherited the memories of their owners, which has led myself and many others to compare these to Hanawa statues. These are ritualistic funeral figures made to represent the life of whoever had passed away and buried alongside them. And as we see during the stories of Amy, Knuckles, and Tails, as we help the little Coco fulfill whatever little mission they're on, finishing whatever their original masters set out to do, we bring them peace. We bring them finality. We bring them the end. It does make me wonder about the Elder and Hermit Cocos, able to speak to Sonic in ways the little ones can't, but so old they can't even remember their purpose, driven purely by whatever lingering instinct they have left to watch over the other Coco. I'd imagine that at least the Elder represents the leader ancient we see in some of the flashbacks. It would make sense for a leader of the ancients to have a larger, more elaborate Coco, and it would also make sense for that Coco to have a splintered memory if its original owner had a fading mind still determined to protect its people, even if they had long forgotten why they were even doing it to begin with. It also makes me think about something we have talked about on Sunset City, the Titans. I forgot who brought up this particular idea, but someone posited that even these colossal creations could have, in some fashion, become a vessel to the spirits of the pilots who died in them. That would explain how they can function on their own, and why Sage can't fully control them, only point them towards Sonic. Their pilots died fighting the end, and maybe these lingering memories only know how to fight. You know, while I think about it though, it does make me wonder what the purpose of the other robots were around the islands. Maybe we'll have to do a deeper dive into the ancients and their civilization another time. More to the point though, I think the Coco might be one of the stronger elements of the overall narrative of the game. The themes of the story focus on life and death, on cherishing what we have while we have it, our connections to each other, the ones we love, and taking the time to take care of ourselves. We need to live our lives, learn from the past, but continue to move forward, coming to terms with what was lost and moving on. That's a lot more subtext than I'm generally used to from a song game, and it's fairly heavy subject matter, but I'm just not sure this narrative quite nailed the landing. I can't help but feel a lot of this tone exists because, again, Breath of the Wild did it. And yes, I do believe that's the case, there are far too many parallels, but at the same time, that doesn't mean Frontiers didn't make something special here, something its own. In Breath of the Wild, the allies you come across are already dead. You have already lost. You travel through a world you have failed to save. That game was about picking up the pieces after you fail, after you lose the people you care for. It's a story about making a life for yourself after you've lost everything. Every victory was bittersweet. You aren't bringing your allies back to life. Even when you free a divine beast, they stay dead. But you've guaranteed that those who are still alive can continue to do so. And through them, the legacy of your friends never truly fades. In Frontiers, yeah, Sonic's friends get some progression in their characterization, but they aren't really losing anything. They see the deaths of an ancient race and reflect on their own lives, which isn't bad by any means. They did enough here to make the story their own. I just don't know if that's enough to lay on this ridiculously melancholy tone throughout the game. It sometimes feels so needlessly dramatic, which is something I know plenty of you missed. And hey, they even throw in a child murder. What a callback. But the more I thought about the story, specifically the ending, I think it's pretty apparent they're going to continue to explore all of this in the future. At least I hope so. I did think at first it was a little corny and needless to once again do a Sonic fake-out death, but I will give them this much. Returning Sonic comes at the cost of his friends. Until the end of the game where he literally beats death and brings them all back. But even that victory comes at a cost. In Sage. And yes, they do show Eggman bringing her back in some form after the credits roll. And at first, I just rolled my eyes at this revelation. They mirrored Shadow's story so hard and couldn't even wait till the next game to bring her back. But I think this says a lot without saying much of anything. Everybody in this game was willing to to 
sacrifice themselves completely for each other. They reflected on who they are as people, and they come out of all of this learning a little something more about themselves. They all learn a lesson through some sort of loss. Everyone does, except for Eggman. He immediately brings Sage back, who has grown more than anybody else in this story. She learned the value of life and love, and gave up everything to save her father and the world he resides on. And while I'm sure a large part of that is because Eggman grew to love her as a daughter, it's still pretty clear he has not been deterred from his original goal, taking control of the Ancients technology and cyberspace. As we see, for the final time, that mysterious symbol appear on the screen, letting us know that he has invaded cyberspace from the other side, with the help of Sage. But after all of this rambling, I think it's time we finally talk about what exactly that symbol can mean. I've seen people mention it could be love, which sure, I could see that. And I remember Fidel mentioning that life was another popular theory, and yeah, that could be explained into making sense. And for a little while, I thought it might just represent cyberspace as a whole, or the ancients. It's not quite as flowery or fun, it's about as straightforward of an answer as you could come up with, but I guess it could also represent afterlife. It does show up on screen anytime a Coco passes on, but if that was the case, I don't think it would make sense to have it adorned around the structures as we see throughout the game. But in the same conversation I had with Stevie about Amy, I did ask her what she thought it meant, and she responded with one of my favorite answers so far home. As she put it, the ancients were robbed of their original home. They didn't want to come to Earth. They had to. They made the best of what they could to make a new life for themselves. A new home, even in the form of cyberspace. Because even when they pass on, in some way, they are coming home. I'm doing her explanation an injustice. She went into far more detail than that. But there is still one more word I wanted to throw out there. What if it meant frontiers? Kishimoto has stated that the end is represented by a moon because, in many cultures, the moon is used as a symbol of death, and death means a lot of things to a lot of people. So depending on who sees it, that form will change. And that made me think quite a bit about my personal fears and feelings on it, what it means to me. And I think the game represents that not just in this enemy that we fight, but also how each character handles that very idea themselves. But no matter how you feel about it, no matter what you try to do about it, no matter where you you run to, it will come for you all the same. You can see it as this big, dark, looming void, a powerful celestial force, but at the end, it's all unknown. So we can either fear it or we can face it, and any unknown challenge, by boldly going forward to new adventures or to a new home, to a new frontier. It's a word that tells you not to fear the unknown. It tells you to celebrate. And this game, like Sonic itself, goes out of its way to celebrate its history, but not linger in it. Never stop moving forward. Never stay static. I think Frontiers is not just a name. It's a philosophy. I think every story being told here ties itself to that theme. I think the game itself is telling us that this series is going to go in a bold, new, unknown direction. Because this series, like Sonic himself, has faced total annihilation more than a couple of times, but still we move forward. And yet, while I've said it plenty of times, I don't know if the stories, the references, the characters, I don't know if anything really quite gave me everything I was looking for, but it did leave me wanting more. It made me excited to see what comes next. It made me excited to see what comes from this new frontier. And that, my friends, is where we're going to end it for today. Thank you so much for sticking around, and thank you for your patience if you've been waiting for me to talk about Sonic Frontiers proper on this channel. This is only one of two videos, probably three, once the DLC finally drops. I'm interested to see what this game looks like once they're finally done with all of that. I'm really excited to see what you guys felt about the story specifically, what you thought that symbol meant, what your favorite character interactions were, and if you're also excited to see where they go with this. How do you think these characters are going to play? Where do you think their stories are going to go? I don't think Frontiers was perfect, but I do think it was a bold new step, and I'm excited to see where things go from here. And if you are too, be sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And hey, if you want to help any more than that, I do have a Patreon. Gets you access to my Discord server, videos early, some other fun stuff, like shouting out super cool people like this. Kyle Winter, Cirrus the Skeptic, Joseph Duncan Sonic 2 Blue, John, Josh Strider, Elder Monroe, Faison Razo, 
Azul, Hatsworth, Tiny Jericho, Jack of All Spades, Tristan Trap, Meekers, Dun Dun, Quote, Resident Fanboy, Miles the Prower, Jeremy Singer, Mr. Boo J, Sam Webster, Dwight Graham, Fishflop, Lucas Lipker, The Bad Pal, Jonathan Dobbs, Cloverhood, Haley, Mr. Dr. SP, Dr. Appending, Cecil the Gallade, The Dark Neon, Stefan Placonica, Three Monic, Graham J. Hall, Lenny X, Wayne is Boss, Jamie Chevalier, Lederick, Hi, uh, hello, Jimmy Duke, STR, The Lumberjack, Can You Hear Me? Please, if you can hear me, you're in a coma and the doctors are about to pull the plug. You have to give me a sign you're still in there. Oh my god. NBTV, Mute, Trash Baphomet, Autumn from Twitter.com, SSG, Infinite Sonic, Genbu from Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a turtle titan. That is the size of a continent that you explore. Signed, That Pie Remain. That is my one of my favorite games ever. I haven't even played it, but that fact alone makes it peak gaming. Oh my god. Jin Sayotome, Boten, I'm not reading that. Nezend, Enerjack 5, Grayson Conagher, Spades the Nocturne, Ken K, Ven 101, Paxton Bisbee, Sindarin 7, Stevie Cole. Congrats again, Stevie. I'm so proud of you. And thank you again for sharing some of your radical ideas about Amy and the end and the symbol and all that. That was a super fun conversation. Also, forgot to shout her out, but she also made the thumbnail art you're looking at, which is just incredible as per usual. Where's Arnold? 3 Rule 4, Twilord, number one boss baby fan, Paisley, Eric Delgado, Cody Gracious, Kodinsky, Jumbo Art, PK Durbar, Crimson Rose, Give Up Your Children, Separate, Sonic PAJ, Munisent, Zagard Lagan, called turn a Zagard Lagan. I what? You don't have much time. Move your hand, wiggle your big toe. The American healthcare system is a cesspool of villainy. Work with me here. Oh my god. Can confirm it's a cesspool. Can 100% confirm that. Roxas the Cat, Godzilla, Makuta of Salt, Gleam the Anomaly, Alexander Watson, Kalei Presley, Neil Gompa, Conan Kudo, Aeon 3 Valifor, Tenric Terror, But Sects, LLX the Comic Creator, check out my charity merch store at llxstore.com. Well, there, there you go. That's certainly a way to promote yourself. Native Nerd 27, and uh, yeah, wow, that's a lot of folks. Thank you guys so much for your support. Thank you to all the patrons who do help out here. It means a lot to me. You help me get bills paid. It's, uh, yeah, you're literally keeping me alive. Thank you. But hey, guys, I've been rambling long enough. It's time to bring this to the end, and I will catch you all later. Toot toot, Sonic Warriors.